Okay, so the year is 2014. You've just started secondary school and George Ezra is in the charts. Life is good, but over at Amazon, human resources have a problem. So the company is expanding fast. That same year, they partnered with Twitch, they launched the Amazon Echo, and they launched their own smartphone, which obviously didn't go too well for them. But the point being that employees at the company was increasing uh, dramatically. So it was about doubling once every two years. In fact, about 1% of their budget was going to recruitment, which obviously they like to minimize if possible. So Amazon obviously already had quite a lot of experience with machine learning. They were maybe one of the best companies for this at the time. Uh, they'd use it for recommender systems, uh, fraud detection. We have Amazon Robotics, speech recognition, and logistics. And it felt like the logical next step was to use it for automated hiring. So the idea was obviously quite simple. The CVs of candidates who'd applied to Amazon in the past were labeled based on their eventual result. That information was fed into a state-of-the-art model, uh, which evaluated each incoming application. That decision was then passed on to a human recruiter who could use it as evidence when reading CVs and interviewing candidates. And the idea was that eventually this could be handled entirely by AI. So, um, Two years or so after that, uh, Amazon started noticing a problem. Now, this tool had never been used to actually make decisions itself, only to uh, inform other decisions. But um, they noticed that the tool was quite misogynistic. So phrases like women's chess club captain, um, feminism society, all of these would lead to a significantly worse score on a resume. But even after removing uh, explicit references to gender, weird things were still happening. So words like enacted and produced would do significantly worse, worse um, than by replacing them with words like executed or captured. Now, it's likely that the aggressiveness of language isn't linked to job performance. Uh, instead, this was language that was more likely to be used by men. Okay, so obviously this wasn't really a good look for Amazon, um, but I do wonder if it's maybe indicative of a broader problem. So if you design a system to replicate human decisions, uh, and it makes a lot of objectively bad decisions, does that not mean that the human decisions were wrong too? How do we know, for example, uh, that the AI decisions were more biased than the human ones? And if these are different types of bias that are coming in, could we maybe make better decisions by using a combination of AI and human decisions? So this is a talk about AI bias, but I'm hoping that already all of you, already all of you know that AI is biased. Um, all of you know that AI perpetuates and exacerbates human biases. So the big question I want to answer today is how much of this is perpetuation and how much is exacerbation? Could AI be more biased than humans? Okay, so here's a quick content overview. Um, we're going to start by defining bias. Um, we'll talk about prejudice within hiring, which is a specific type of bias. Um, and then we'll approach this topic from the perspective of a Bayesian network. Uh, and then that will help us compare it to our own flawed reasoning, uh, why a human's prejudiced. And then finally, let's see whether AI could be worse. And let's finish all off with wondering what Amazon got wrong. OK. So defining bias. Uh, bias is quite a fuzzy term. Um, I pulled up Wikipedia here, as all talks should do. Um, what we have is bias is a disproportionate weight in favor of or against an idea or thing. And it's actually quite hard to think of what you couldn't label as this. I mean, surely everything is a disproportionate weight in favor of or against an idea or thing, depending on who you're asking. Um, but since we're already in the realm of quantifying decision making, instead we're going to use this definition. Bias is a systematic error. So in the context of measurement, uh, bias and noise are well defined. Uh, it's a quick recap. Noise is random deviation, and bias is predictable deviation, predictable inaccuracy. So within measurement, um, what we're doing is we're selecting from a space of possible measurements, trying to find the one closest to the optimal measurement. And in this case, we're using limited tools, right? A ruler is fairly good, but it's not going to be able to give us the exact answer. So in this case, we're measuring a giraffe when we get 4.5 meters. Uh, but decision-making, here we're selecting from a space of possible decisions, and we're trying to find the optimal decision. So again, we're using uh, limited resources. Maybe we have limited time. Maybe we have limited human reasoning, and we're finding the optimal decision. So in this case, we can combine the two ideas, and we can define bias as making wrong decisions in a predictable direction. OK, so prejudice is a specific type of bias. Um, and in this case, we're going to define it as bias against a particular group of people. OK, so in the context of uh, hiring, the optimal decision is to hire the best employees. And uh, what ex exactly is the best employee? Is that the one who will lead to the most profit, the most efficient? That's quite a difficult question to answer. Um, and in general, it's useful to think of there being some kind of optimum, but we're never actually going to be able to find that optimum, just in the same way we can never find somebody's exact height, for example. Uh, but we can, you know, through eventual uh, communication and so on, uh, get closer and closer to that optimum. So unless recruiters are omniscient, perfectly rational gods, um, decisions will be noisy in hiring, though. So here are some reasons that might be. Maybe you had a bad day on the interview. 
Maybe you already knew the interview question. Maybe you were randomly forgotten after the interview or so on. I think if you uh, talk, it, it, sorry, if you're the, one of the first people to be interviewed, then that can make the interviewer remember you more. But if you're, say, like the second or the third person, you're less likely to. Um, maybe there were tech issues on the day. Maybe you looked like the recruiter's ex. Um, anyway, noisy decisions are obviously bad. So a bad employee can be left at a company for years, and that can affect everybody else. Um, also, an economy full of companies all providing worse service leads to negative consequences for everybody, right? Um, I'm hoping that bit's fairly obvious. Uh, but from the employee's perspective, actually, this isn't too much of a problem. So let's say I apply to one firm, um, and I get rejected there for a, for a totally random reason, which isn't related to me as a person. Um, then when I go to another firm, the chances are I won't be rejected at that place as well. So bias cancels out, uh, but noise doesn't, actually, and that's why this is such an issue. Uh, systemic inaccuracy uh, means that certain jobs, certain people can't get a job anywhere. All the bad effects of noise are concentrated into a particular group of people. So in this case, let's say we have some uh, system that's biased against women, then uh, a woman might go and get, try and get loads of different jobs and won't be able to get any of them. So this is all concentrating those bad um, decisions into a specific class of people, and that's why bias is so much worse than noise in this context. Okay, but I am skipping uh, quite a bit of controversy here. Um, so with this definition I'm using, a system is defined as biased, not based on whether it leads to equal representation, but based on whether it makes wrong decisions. So it is entirely possible that the proportion of CEOs that leads to better outcomes could be skewed in one direction or another. So let's consider men and women again. A system in which an unbiased algorithm would lead to unequal representation would be biased, the system itself, but not the algorithm. Look, obviously, men and women are almost equally capable at birth, so only bias would account for this systematic effect. But actually, gender does subtly affect everything. Every interaction you might have with another person, all the opportunities you were pushed into, maybe the, the school you wanted to go to or the school you were forced into to go to by your parents, or maybe you just had one conversation which would have been different if you had a different gender and so on. Um, so these, these very different things could actually lead to real differences. Um, tiny differences could be very gradually amplified if you were slightly better at sport as a, as a young child then you could have spent more time investing into that and become much better at sport and so on. Very small differences could snowball into larger ones for all sorts of reasons. So in this case we are using bias to mean uh, wrong decisions. Um, although it's worth saying that an algorithm which doesn't uh, relate to equal representation isn't necessarily fair and that's another uh, difficult question. And this debate actually is quite relevant at the moment. Uh, so most people would agree that any obviously biased system should be corrected. So what we could do for that is suppose there was one system which was uh, providing 90% of jobs to men or something, and we, knew, we expected that the, the correct proportion was maybe 51% or so. What we could do is that all the borderline people we could maybe randomly reject and so on, and that would turn a biased decision into a noisy one, which we know is better. Um, but the question is, perhaps we should do more than this. We already know that our systems are biased and that's leading to worse outcomes for different people. Maybe what we could do is we could artificially insert bias into the algorithms themselves to make up for, systematic, for systemic problems. And there's other questions here. Is this worth the reduction in decision quality we would see? Is this unfair to the people who would otherwise be selected? Questions like that. I'm not going to get into them in this talk, but I think it's interesting to know about. And I think it's interesting to frame this discussion through this more systematic idea as well. Okay, enough humanities. Let's go on to the exciting stuff. So, the perfect recruiter. Let's assume, uh, as a present, um, we get access to all the information on trillions of humans who have ever existed and could ever exist. How could we use this to create the best model possible to assign jobs based on looking only at some resumes? So, let's assume first that each person has some job suitability score, and maybe we could range that from zero to 100, uh, dependent on how uh, suitable they are for the job. Um, we're gonna have some uncertainty in this. We're never gonna be 100% sure on how good they would be for the job. Uh, so instead, what we could do is encode this as a probability distribution, representing our Bayesian uncertainty to how, much, uh, to how suitable they are for the job. And let's suppose also that maybe we can glean all this info from the resume. Maybe we can work out what school they attended, maybe we can guess at the number of siblings they have, um, and their interview performance, perhaps we have. So we know that the, the purple nodes are going to affect the yellow node in some way, but this could be quite complex, right? One model you could have for this would be to feed them all into the job suitability and then just create that as some weighted function and stuff, like a, like a linear model, essentially. Um, but we actually know that it's quite a lot more complicated than this. So for example, let's say we know that someone goes to a good school. That might make us think that maybe they were encouraged into coding, and then maybe from that they're a good coder, and maybe from that they're worth hiring. But these are all quite complex relations. How do we encode this mathematically? 
Well, I'm glad you asked, or I'm glad I asked. Um, each node is a belief uh, and a probability distribution giving our uncertainty in this belief. This is a Bayesian network. So for example, um, hours coding is a belief. We believe that you have spent some hours coding, but we actually don't know how many hours coding you've had. So instead of thinking, maybe it could be this or it could be this, or it's between this and this, I can actually give an exact probability, probability distribution on my best guess for how many hours you've coded. Um, so obviously we have edges in this network as well. And edges in this case are going to be dependencies. So here we're going to say that the number of hours you've spent coding is dependent on the school you attended. I think that's fairly intuitive. Um, and a Bayesian network also has to be a directed acyclic graph for most of the algorithms to actually work. So what we can do is we can say instead of a dependency, we can actually make that more specific and say it's a causality. So the school attended actually causes the number of uh, hours coding we, we expect you've done to change. And the reason this works is that causality defines a well order. Uh, if you don't know what that means, that's not, not too much of an issue. But essentially, if something causes something, if A causes B, then we know from that that B cannot cause A, just in terms of the um, temporal location of these events. Uh, so that means that there is uh, a causal order, and this will be a directed acyclic graph. So therefore, school attended causes you to have coded for a different number of hours. OK, we'll label those nodes. Um, and also, this means as well that we can make now uh, more quantitative statements, right? Let's say, for example, that I think there's a 10% chance that you've uh, done more than 1,000 hours coding. I can say that PA greater than 1,000 is equal to 0.1. OK, so let's add some more uh, nodes to our Bayesian network. Um, so I'll just walk you through a few of these. We're going to say that number of siblings isn't caused by anything. We don't know anything about that. Uh, but we're going to say that communication skills is caused by uh, the school that you attended and the number of siblings you may have. Um, and it's worth saying as well that all of these nodes are dependent on some way with others, um, in that number of siblings is dependent on coding test score. If I showed you someone's coding test score, you'd be able to glean information on how many siblings they have. If I showed you the number of someone's siblings, you'd be able to glean information on their coding test score. Anyway, obviously this Bayesian network isn't perfect by any means. Um, there are all sorts of additional nodes we could add. We could actually put nodes in the middle of edges um, and then say that certain nodes aren't directly dependent. Directly dependent. Uh, but we would actually say that this Bayesian network is correct because it does meet the condition of Bayesian networks. And that is that nodes are independent of their non-neighbors, conditional on their neighbors. OK, so what we could do is we could represent all of this as a uh, joint distribution of nine variables. We could throw out the whole Bayesian network idea. And we could say, I'm just going to have one function, p, a, b, c, d, e, f, g, h, i. And that will give me the probability of any of these, all of these specific variables. You can insert the variables for each of these, and I'll show you the probability. And with that, you'd actually be able to get all the information you wanted from this Bayesian network. Let's say I wanted to get the probability that somebody wanted to, went to Eton, for example. What I would do is I'd say the probability that B equals Eton, and I'd sum up all the values where B equals Eton, and then I'd work that out. So we actually don't need the Bayesian network. We could represent it with this horrendously complex function. Uh, but that is the exact issue, obviously. This function is horrendously complicated, uh, and it's difficult to generate and difficult to work with. And that is where Bayesian networks come in. Um, so let's say I ask you to tell me how eligible someone is for a job based on their Latin score, um, based on how fluent they are in Latin. And you might begrudgingly do that. Um, and you might think, OK, well, maybe if they're good at Latin, that might mean they attended a better school and so on. So I think about that. And the way that your thought process might go might look something like this. Each of these is de directly dependent with the other ones, and this would all feed into each other. But now suppose I said, OK, I'm already going to tell you one of these. I'm already going to tell you uh, that they went to Eton, for example. And now I would guess that how fluent they are at Latin barely makes any difference to their job suitability. And this, in this simplified model, it wouldn't. And that is exactly the, the Bayesian condition here. Uh, Latin fluency is independent of job suitability, conditional on already knowing um, the school attended. Uh, and also, one other point. Um, Markov chains are a sub, uh, subset of Bayesian networks. So a Markov chain is a Bayesian network where each node is connected one to the other. OK. So actually, we can actually encode the entire network with these much simpler conditional distributions than having this horrendously complicated nine-value distribution. So for example, to determine um, job suitability, we'd need some function which takes a value for communication skills and a value for coding skills and returns a new probability distribution for job suitability. So this is a conditional distribution that we have here. OK. So I've, these are um, some calculated priors. These aren't exact uh, graphs by any means. These are just examples. 
Um, for PB, remember that we already have the prior, so PB is this um, red one up here. Uh, but we already have, have the prior as before. Um, so that, that one we don't actually need to calculate. But for PD, uh, we do want to calculate that because we only have PD given B. So we'd be able to calculate that by just instantiating B into it. So we've been able to calculate all our priors here, and then you could say how many hours of coding has this person done, and you can use the probability distributions there. But obviously, Bayesian networks are a lot more powerful than this. Let's say, for example, that you got some evidence which gave you uh, strong evidence that someone's Latin frequency was good, and your idea of how, how good Latin fluency, sorry, and your idea of how good they were at Latin uh, shifted like this. Then what you could do is you could propagate that belief through all areas of the network. And the first question is, how do we propagate that to B? And hopefully by now you've figured out that given this is called a Bayesian network, we're going to use Bayes' rule. Um, and then we propagate that as, as so on. And then we propagate this to all these. There's some fairly complicated rules in terms of how you can actually propagate nodes when multiple are going in. But I think most of them are, um, are fairly intuitive. And I don't want to spend too much time on maths today. So eventually we work out that uh, this is your new uncertainty distribution for job suitability. And actually you're more uncertain than you were before, uh, for example. Um, in terms of that you think that could be different possible ones, but you still have clean information. Okay. So the big question then is how do we actually generate our priors? And I don't want to spend too much time on this in the talk, but there are some very, very clever ways. Uh, in general, it is an open problem. So one thing you could do is you could say intuitively, I expect this to be a normal distribution. Intuitively, I expect this to be a Pareto distribution. Uh, one really nice thing uh, that we can do because we have our gift of trillions and trillions of people is that we can create it empirically using fairly obvious frequentist methods. Um, another way that I don't want to go into too much, but is using hierarchical Bayesian, mo Bayesian models. So that is where you take um, different evidence from loads of different domains, and then you synthesize that into a higher level of your hierarchy. Um, and based on that, you create uh, essentially multiple different priors, and then you test each of these priors based on how good the model was actually fitting at it. Then you create your, then from that, you select your, what you were taking as your priors. So essentially, you're using Bayesian reasoning to use Bayesian reasoning. I can go into that further at the end. Um, but essentially, this is an open problem. There are lots of different ways we can do this. And this is one of the most interesting things in, in Bayesian modeling. Anyway, I like to think that this perfect Bayesian reasoning is the elusive, unobtainable gold standard of decision making. If you did have all the information, this would be the best way to make those decisions. And we actually have quite a lot of evidence that human reasoning approximates this. For example, if I did say, uh, what is, uh, how much information does Latin fluency give you, job give you about job suitability, I would hope that, that for most of you this would change based on whether you knew the school attended or not. Um, and there is quite a lot of uh, psychological research for the usage of Bayesian reasoning for all sorts of things. Okay, so next one, humans are prejudiced. Um, so humans actually weren't designed only to make good decisions. We were designed to have babies and so on. And making good decisions was useful for that. Um, but in general, there are all kinds of reasons why you might be biased. So for example, perhaps it made more sense to be trusting and kind to prettier people uh, in our evolution. Um, and, and actually, that would make sense in terms of if you spend more time with pretty people and they liked you more, then maybe you're likely to um, go on to be closer to them. Um, so we actually do have some research evidence for this, for example. What they found was that researchers um, gave people different essays. Uh, one essay was really bad and one essay was really good. And the essays were rated much higher only based on the writer's attractiveness instead of the actual quality of the essay itself. Perhaps uh, the environment we evolved in, well, obviously the environment we evolved in was significantly different to the one we're in now. And perhaps in that environment, it might have been appropriate to assume that someone who looked like they were from another tribe was a danger to you. Obviously now that reaction is harmful because we're in different environments. So there's some research evidence for that as well. So the obvious thing is, can't I just consciously avoid these biases? And unfortunately, not really. Uh, we're usually unaware of them, and usually they're quite difficult to actually uh, get out of our brain. And in general as well, any bias is a function of any inadequate reasoning process. If, if, our, inadequate reasoning pro if, if our reasoning was entirely noisy as opposed to bias, and realistically we could make perfect decisions by just making loads of them and then taking the average of them. And we know that obviously we can't do that. If, if biases could be easily consciously reversed, then they wouldn't have been great survivor mechanisms. And the final thing as well is that biases can also exist in purely rational systems, or essentially systems where everybody is acting rationally. So for example, let's suppose I was in a rational system and I'm perfectly rational. 
Um, I, I particularly like my family. I would say I'm biased towards my family's life. And that's normally fine, but if I have a disproportionate amount of influence on this system, then suddenly the whole system becomes biased towards my family's life. And the other thing as well is that very small differences can create positive feedback cycles for all sorts of ways. If there was a, a biased system of um, job recruitment again, and there was a very, very small difference, then it might have made economic sense for one company to only interview people of a particular group. And that would have then snowballed into more bias because that particular group gets better at the job and communicates more with other people and so on and so on. Okay, so narrowing our attention back to hiring. Um, a 2003 US study found that only changing the names and resumes to ones more common for white people, such as Emily instead of Lakeisha, uh, increased the number of callbacks by a staggering 50%. Now, this effect actually dropped to only 3% in 2022. But as we'll see, bias is usually much more subtle than this. It's quite hard to find empirical evidence um, for how much bias does exist in, in hiring, because it's obviously quite difficult to quantify interviews. But all research does agree that human hiring is still biased, and this has tangible negative effects. So how is recruitment looking today? Well, of uh, the Fortune 500 companies, they found that 99% of them actually admitted to using AI hiring um, quite regularly. So this, this is quite a big thing. Um, just to give a sense of quite how prevalent uh, automated hiring is, I've got a quote here from Ian Siegel, the CEO of ZipRecruiter, which I think is somewhat like, like, somewhat like LinkedIn. Um, he says, when people tell you that you should dress up your accomplishments or that you should use non-standard resume templates to make your resume stand out, that's awful advice. The only job your resume has is to be comprehensible to the software or robot reading it because that robot is going to decide whether a human ever gets their eyes on it. So Ian goes on to say that AI can't be less biased than humans because we can feed the data we want to into the system. But after a lot of research, I think Ian is wrong on this particular point. Sorry about that, Ian. Okay, so we will assume that these models are trained to emulate the average of a data set of human decisions. And obviously that data set will be full of bias, and the model isn't going to understand that, so it's going to replicate that bias. But we're actually gonna look at other ways that the model can be biased as well. The first one is that the environment at data collection is not the same as the environment during usage. For example, it used to be unreasonable to work from home, so good candidates would signal that they could work in an office. But now the environment has changed, and this no longer applies. Now, humans are bad at adapting to this. There are still a lot of recruiters who think, oh, if you can't work from home, then that's, that's terrible. But AI could be even worse if we don't regularly update the models. And actually, this will probably get worse as AI starts training on its own data. For example, what will happen as ChatGPT trains on its own content? Uh, the next one is bias from misunderstanding novelty. The subset of all hiring decisions which are used as training data is likely to be disproportionate, with certain types of resumes poorly accounted for. But even if it wasn't disproportionate, um, then it's still likely that there are some very unusual conditions that appear infrequently in the training data set or don't appear at all. So imagine a resume from a different country where tests hadn't been standardized. What would you do if you were a human recruiter and you heard this resume? Maybe you'd send them an email or you'd bring them in for an interview. An AI wouldn't be able to do that. All an AI could do is, is just work off what it's got and it wouldn't be able to communicate with that person. Um, and it's also worth saying that this issue actually crops up in loads of other domains in AI as well. Um, so one example is the airport scanner for US, US security. So in this, the border guard has a button to identify whether the person going through the scanner is male or female. And based on that, the machine scans the body and determines peculiarities. Now, this system usually works fine, except for trans women who've had top surgery, having both breasts and a penis. The scanner identifies an anomaly, and the alarms go off. Now, obviously, this is a bad failure of the system, a terrible failure of the system, and it's incredibly awkward for a lot of people. But humans do tend to be okay at adapting after this, and usually with an explanation, they'll be happy to let you through. But an AI might not even let you explain in the first place. Okay, this one, I think, is a really big problem, and this is bias from lack of information. If a small, very, very small difference exists between men and women, for example, in, in a job, in a job uh, standard, let's say maybe 51% of men are, are uh, like the, the correct proportion is 51% of men or so on. And that's because the system is biased and so on. But if we only gave an AI access to whether this person is a man or a woman, then the best decision that the AI could make would be only to hire men. That's just from a, um, a sad perspective, I guess. So what is going on here? This, this seems terrible, right? Now, there could be a strong indirect dependency between job suitability and gender, but this is only respective on not knowing all of this other information. And any self-respecting job test should have much better access to all of this knowledge. If you don't, you're going to be biased. Okay, so another idea that we can do is we can say, okay, well, not enough information is a bad thing, so let's just give it as much data as possible. But the question is, how do we actually encode the patterns that we learned before? 
So let's suppose we don't actually know the relationships. And if we did know all the relationships for different things, then we wouldn't actually have to use a, a Bayesian network or so on. We could just use a, use a fairly standard algorithm. So we'd have to encode that gender is irrelevant, conditional on certainty in job performance. That's quite a complex encoding, right? And could we learn all of these relationships from just a data set of resumes? Wouldn't it require knowledge from a much more general domain? The relationships we need to learn look something like this. But instead, a lot of linear models look like this. So they struggle to encode complex relationships between features. And this is one example, one advantage of neural networks, right? These intermediary nodes allow them to encode a lot of these relationships, a lot of these complex relationships. But even then, neural networks are unlikely to be able to extract these relationships from resumes only. A human analysis of a resume uses all sorts of domain, uh, of domain general information, so information outside of the context of resumes. And the, this information cannot be gleaned from scanning resumes alone. So this is one advantage that a general AI would have, you know, something like ChatGPT, but these are currently not being applied in AI, in AI hiring, at least to my knowledge. Okay, so one more obvious solution. Why don't we just remove explicit references to gender, explicit references to other um, protected characteristics and so on? And it's actually quite difficult to know the effectiveness of these measures because it, it does literally move the goalposts. Uh, but one thing I would be slightly concerned about um, is that imagine, for example, that you started getting rejected from uh, job reports, uh, not, not exactly because of your gender, but for doing psychology and for playing netball, both of which are strongly correlated to gender. So the question in this case is, would you even know why this is happening? Obviously, bias related to gender is, is, a, is a significant problem. But if you, you apply to a job and you got rejected because you do netball and you do psychology, how, how would you even know where, where to go about changing this? And that is, that, I think that's another issue. If you only remove these explicit characteristics, that can in some cases obscure the bias. And the other thing as well is that um, a lot of the time, things like ChatGPT have attempted to actually just remove any references to things which might be bad. So for example, you remove any references to LGBT people because that could be sexual in, in content. Uh, and that actually means that these groups are further disadvantaged because they struggle to communicate more because of these issues. And the final one is that simple algorithms are inherently exploitable. So before we were trying to optimize for keywords, our keywords as a metric were coupled with job performance. Um, let me see if I have that here, no. Okay, so keywords as a metric were coupled with job performance. If someone was better at a job, then their resume would contain better keywords. But by then trying to test for that, now you change the human system. And now humans intentionally try and do better keywords, so now keywords are no longer coupled. And this actually is what happened with IQ as well. So in the 1920s, um, what they did was they got loads of, I think it was uh, white middle-aged boys and they essentially measured loads and loads of different types of intelligence, and they found all of them were correlated to the central IQ score. So the obvious thing was, well, we can only test that. And for most systems, that would work. But obviously, the human system is inherently dynamic, and now you can actually do much better in an IQ score by just taking a tutorial on IQ scores beforehand. Okay, so in terms of what Amazon got wrong, it was basically everything. All of these things are for various reasons they actually didn't take into account. So for example, uh, bias from lack of information, only the resume was actually used. It didn't take any holistic information. Bias from censorship, they attempted to remove references to gender and still found that there were other issues there. Okay, bias is by no means an insolvable problem. I haven't focused on solutions here because I think it's actually better for most people to have an understanding of the problem itself. Um, that said, I did find alarmingly list of research dealing with a lot of these issues from this much more computational perspective. I and mean, I think it's an area of study we can actually learn a lot from as data science as data scientists. There is a real lack of understanding of the complexity of this topic, particularly among powerful players in the data science industry. Um, and you will also have noticed as well that all of the AI-generated images I use in this are not exactly uh, representative of the average person. Even the uh, woman there, I actually had to input woman to get that. Okay, so if there is one thing you take away from this talk, let it be this. Until we can improve the reasoning in these models, and the quality of their input data, it might not be appropriate for them to be the only thing used in making sensitive decisions. Thank you.